okay. I forget them too. Never mind. You'll be fine. All right. Last chance. assist me in opening the lodge. Brother Geshwin. What is the first care of every mason? To see that the lodge is properly tiled. That's right. So, direct that duty to be done. Brother Griffiths, the next guy. That's right. To see that none but Masons are present. degree. Brother James, how many principal offers and officers are there in the lodge? Three. How many assistant officers are there? Three. And the situation of the Tyler his duty. That is correct. To be armed with a drawn sword to keep off all intruders and cowards to masonry and see that everything, including the candidates, are properly prepared. And what is the situation? his duty. That is correct. The duty of admitting Masons upon proof receive the candidates in due form and obey the commands. And the situation and his duty. That is right. To carry all messages and communications from and to Masons and to see that the same are punctually obeyed. Mm -hmm. And his duty to bear all messages and commands 
and await the return. Brother, what is your position? To mark the sun at its meridian, to call the brethren from labour to refreshment, and from the refreshment to labour, that profit and pleasure may be the result. And just to remind you, and for the benefit of our new candidate, we are not a secret society. We are a society with secrets. Yes, to mark the setting sun, to close the lodge by command of the master, and having seen that every brother has done his due. Good. The lodge being duly formed, before I declare it open, let us invoke the assistance of the great architect of the universe in all of our undertakings. May our labours thus begun in order be conducted in peace and closed in harmony. So mote it. Brethren, in the name of the great architect of the universe, I declare the lodge duly open for the purposes of Freemasonry in the first degree. There is a report. Brother, I require as to who wants admission. Have you there? How does he hope to obtain these privileges? The tongue of good report has already been heard in his favour. Do you vouch that he is properly prepared? Then let him be admitted in due course. Brothers, deacons. Tell me, did you feel anything? No person can be made a mason unless he is free and of mature age. I demand of you 
Are you a free man? And of the full age of 21 years or older. Thus assured, I will thank you to kneel while the blessing of heaven is invoked upon our proceedings. Vouchsafe thine aid, Almighty Father and Supreme Governor of the Universe, to our present convention, and grant that this candidate of Freemasonry may so dedicate and devote his life to thy service, as to become a true and faithful brother among us. Endue him with a competency to thy divine wisdom that assisted by the secrets of our Masonic art, he may the better be enabled to unfold the beauties of true godliness to the honour and glory of the Grand Architect. So mote it be. Right glad am I to find your faith so well founded. Relying on such sure support, you may safely rise and follow your leader with a firm but humble confidence. For where the name of yours is invoked, we trust no danger can ensue. The brethren will take notice that the candidate is about to pass in view before them to show that he is the candidate properly prepared and fit to be made a mason. You have been presented in a state of poverty, a state of rebirth. However, you have been well and worthily recommended, regularly proposed and approved in open lodge. And now, coming of your own free will and accord, properly prepared, humbly soliciting to be admitted to the mysteries and privileges of Freemasonry. How do you hope to obtain those privileges? Mm -hmm. By the help of your God, your chosen God, and being free and of good report. Enter free and on good report. How do you hope to obtain these privileges? By the help of your God and being free and of good report. Enter free and of good report. Your presentation shall be attended to, for which purpose I shall address a few questions to the candidate which I trust he will answer with candour. Do you seriously declare, on your honour, unbiased by the improper solicitation of friends against your own inclination, and uninfluenced by mercenary or other unworthy motives, 
you freely and voluntarily offer yourself as a candidate for the mysteries and privileges of Freemasonry. Do you likewise pledge yourself that you are prompted to solicit those privileges by a favourable opinion preconceived of the institution, a general desire of knowledge, and a sincere wish to render yourself more extensively serviceable to your fellow creatures? Do you further seriously declare on your honour that, avoiding fear on the one hand and rashness on the other, you will steadily persevere through the ceremony of your initiation and, if once admitted, you will afterwards act and abide by the ancient usages and established customs of the Order. Brother, you will direct the candidate to advance to the pedestal in due form. It is my duty to inform you that masonry is free and requires a perfect freedom of inclination in every candidate for its mysteries. It is founded on the purest of principles, of piety and virtue. It possesses great and invaluable privileges and in order to secure those privileges to worthy men, and we must trust to worthy men alone Vows of fidelity are required. But let me assure you that in those vows there is nothing incompatible with your civil, moral or religious duties. Are you therefore willing to take a secret oath founded on the principles I have stated to keep inviolate and secrets and mysteries of the order? Then you will kneel on your knees, formed in a square. Give me your right hand, which I place on our constitution. Repeat your name at length, and then say after me. in the presence of the great architect of the universe and of this worthy, worshipful and warranted lodge of free 
and accepted Masons, regularly assembled and properly dedicated of my own free will and accord, do hereby and hereon sincerely and solemnly promise and swear that I will always conceal and never reveal any part or parts, point or points of the secrets or mysteries of or belonging to free and accepted Masons in Masonry, which may heretofore have been known by me or shall now or at any future period be communicated to me, unless it to be a true and lawful brother of brothers, and not even to him or them until after due trial, strict examination, or sure information from a well-known brother that he or they are worthy of that confidence, or in the body of a just, perfect, and regular lodge of ancient Freemasons. I further solemnly promise that I will not write those secrets, indict, carve, mark, engrave, or otherwise them delineate, or cause, or suffer it to be due, or suffer it to be so done by others. If in my power to prevent it, on anything, movable or immovable, under the canopy of heaven, whereby, or whereon, any letter, character, or figure, or the least trace of a letter, character, or figure, may become legible or intelligible to myself or anyone in the world, so that our secret arts and hidden mysteries may improperly become known through my unworthiness. These several points I solemnly swear to observe, without evasion, equivocation, or mental reservation of any kind. Under no less a penalty on the violation of any of them, that of having my tongue removed. So help me, Universal Grand Architect, and keep me steadfast. This is my oath. What you have repeated may be considered but a serious promise as a pledge of your fidelity, and to render it, you will seal it with your lips on the vessel. Let the blessing be restored to the candidate. Having been restored to the blessing of material, let me point out to your attention what we consider the three great, though emblematical, symbols in Freemasonry. The sacred writings are to govern our faith. The rules are to regulate our actions and the constraints and secrets to keep us in due bounds with all mankind, particularly our brethren in Freemasonry. Rise, newly obligated brother among Freemasons.
You are now enabled to discover three secrets. They are situated east, south and west. To rule the day, you must govern the night and direct this latch. This is the first degree tracing. All right. Brother, by your meek and candid behavior this evening, you have escaped two great dangers. But there is a third which will await you until the latest period of your existence. The dangers you have escaped are those of death. One, upon your entrance to the lodge. Upon your entrance, you are presented with a shelled blade. Had you rashly attempted to rush forward, you would have been accessory to your own death, whilst the brother who held it would have remained firm and done his duty. There was, likewise, a rope placed around your neck, a running noose about you, which would have rendered any attempt to flee equally fatal. But the danger which will await you until your latest hour is the penalty of your oblivion of having your life taken, should you improperly disclose the secrets of masonry. now permitted to inform you that there are multiple degrees of Freemasonry and peculiar secrets restricted to each. These, however, are not communicated indiscriminately, but are confirmed on candidates according to merit and abilities. <clears throat> I shall therefore proceed to trust you with the secrets of this degree or those marks by which we are known to each other and distinguished from the rest of the world but must premise your general information that all secrets are true and proper to know a mason by you are therefore expected to stand perfectly erect your feet formed in a square. Your body being thus considered an emblem of your mind and your feet of the restitude of your actions. You will now take a short pace towards me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Right. 
This is an allusion to the penalty of your obligation, implying that, as a man of honour and a mason, you would rather have your hand cut off than improperly disclose the secrets entrusted to you. position, place your ring finger on your right hand, always your right hand, upon my wrist, my artery, all right? With the middle finger, which is your own artery, on the top, okay? This, when regularly given and received, serves to distinguish a brother as well. It doesn't demand a word, but there is a word highly prized among Masons as to guard to their privileges. Too much caution, therefore, cannot be observed in communicating it. It should never be given at length, but always by whispers, to enable you to do which. I must first tell you what that is. The word is respite. R E S P I T E. Respite. R E S P I T E. Respite. As a word specific to our lodge. When whispered, it carries meaning with the brothers. Do not use the word too much. That's why I've chosen the word as well. As in the course of the ceremony, you will be called on for this word. And you will now dictate the answers you are given. So the Grand Architect. What does it demand? A word. Give me that word. Respite. At my initiation, I was taught to be cautious. I will letter or have it with you. R S I E. Good. Now, there is another word, a word that is sacred to all lodges. This word must only be spoken in complete confidence and in confidence of self that the person you are talking to having completed the handshake, is a brother, trusted and true. The word is Boaz. Strength. present to you on this initiation. Have you anything to communicate? You are now free of bondage. I invest you with the distinguishing badge of a mason. 
It is a more ancient item than the golden fleece or Roman eagle, more honourable than the garter or any other award in existence, being the badge of innocence and the bond of friendship. I strongly exhort you ever to wear and consider it as such, and further inform you that you can never disgrace the badge, and it will never disgrace you. Let me add to the observations that you are never to put on that badge should you be about to visit a lodge in which there is a brother with whom you are at variance or against or whom you entertain animosity. In such cases, it is expected that you will invite him to withdraw in order to amicably to settle your differences, which, being happily affected, you may then clothe yourselves, enter the lodge and work with that love and harmony which should at all times characterise Freemasons, but if, unfortunately, your differences be of such that it is not as easily adjusted, it would better that one or both of you retire than the harmony of the lodge should be disturbed by your presence. It is customary at the erection of all stately and superb edifices to lay the first or foundation stone at the northeast corner of the building. You, being newly admitted into masonry, are placed at the northeast part of the lodge, figuratively, to represent that stone. And from the foundation laid this evening, you may raise a superstructure, perfect in its parts, and honorable to the builder. You now stand, to all external appearance, a just and upright mason, and I give it to you in strong terms of recommendation ever to continue and act as such. Indeed, I shall immediately put your principles in some measure to the test by calling upon you to exercise that virtue which may justly be denominated the distinguishing characteristic of a Freemason's heart. I mean charity. I need not here dilate on its excellence. No doubt it has often been felt and practiced by you. Suffice it to say, it has the approbation of heaven and earth, and, like its sister, mercy, blesses him who gives as well as him who receives. In a society so widely extended as Freemasonry, the branches of which are spread over the four quarters of the globe, it cannot be denied that we have many members of rank and opulence. Neither can it be concealed that among the thousands who range under its banners, there are some who, perhaps from circumstances of unavoidable calamity and misfortune, are rejoiced to the lowest ebb of poverty and distress. On their behalf, it is our usual custom to awaken the feelings of every new-made brother by such a claim on his charity as his circumstances in life may fairly warrant. Whatever, therefore, you feel disposed to give, you will deposit, and it will be thankfully received and faithfully applied. Have you anything to give in the course of charity? And were you deprived of anything previously entering the lodge? And if you had not been deprived, would you give freely? I congratulate you on the honourable sentiments by which you are actuated. Likewise, on the inability which in the present instance precludes you from gratifying them. Believe me, this trial was not made with a view to sport with your feelings. Far be from us any such intention. It was done for three special reasons. First, as I have already premised, to put your principles to the test. Secondly, to evidence to the brethren that you had neither money nor dependency about you, for if you had, the ceremony of your initiation thus far must have been repeated. And thirdly, as a warning to your own heart that should you at any future period meet a brother in distressed circumstances who might solicit your assistance, you will remember the peculiar moment you were received into masonry, poor and penniless, and cheerfully embrace the opportunity 
of practicing that virtue which you have professed to admire. You have been presented your rights. It is a measure of our work, the commonality of the grand architect of the universe. We must knock off all superfluous knobs and extrasticities and to further smooth and prepare the stone and render it for the hands of those more expert workmen. But as we are not all operative masons, but rather free and accepted of speculative, we apply these terms to our morals. In this sense, 24 hours in the day of a disciple of the Grand Architect represents 24 hours to be spent in prayer to the almighty design, part in labor and refreshment and part in serving a friend or brother in a time of need without detriment to ourselves or connections. This represents a force of conscience which should keep down all vain and unbecoming thoughts which might obtrude during any of the aforementioned periods, so that our words and actions may ascend unpolluted to the throne of grace. We point out the advantages of education by which means alone we are rendered fit members of regularly organised society. As in the course of the evening you will be called on for certain fees for your initiation, it is proper you should know by what authority we act. This is our charter, or warrant, from the Grand Lodge of England. Which is for your inspection on this or any future evening. Right. Brother, as you have passed through the ceremony of your initiation, let me congratulate you on being admitted a member of our ancient and honourable institution. Ancient, no doubt it is, as having subsisted from time immemorial and honourable, it must be acknowledged to be, as by a natural tendency it continues to make those so who are obedient to its precipice. Indeed, no institution can boast a more solid foundation than that on which Freemasonry rests. The practice of every moral and social virtue and to so high an eminence has its credit been advanced that in every age monarchs themselves have been promoters of the art. As a Freemason, let me recommend to you the most serious contemplation of the Grand Architect, charging you to consider it as the unerring standard of truth and justice and to regulate your actions by the divine precepts it contains. Therein you will be taught the important duties you owe to your God to your neighbour and to yourself. To God, by never mentioning his name, but with that awe and reverence which are due by creatures or creators, imploring his aid in all your lawful undertakings and by looking up to him in every emergence of comfort and support. To your neighbour, by acting with him on the square, by rendering him every kind office which justice of mercy may require, by relieving his necessities and soothing his afflictions. And, as a citizen of the world, I am to enjoin you to be exemplary in the discharge of your civil duties. Still, as a Freemason, there are other excellences of character to which your attention may be peculiarly and forcibly directed. Amongst the foremost of these are secrecy, fidelity, and obedience. Secrecy consists in an inviolable adherence to the obligation you have entered into. Your fidelity must be exemplified by a strict observance of the constitutions of this fraternity. Your obedience must be proved by a strict observance of our laws and regulations. And as one last general recommendation, let me exhort you to dedicate yourself to such pursuits as may at once enable you to be respectable in life, useful to mankind, and an ornament to the society of which you have this day become a member. To study more especially such of the liberal arts and sciences as may lie within the compass of your attainment. And without neglecting the ordinary duties of your station, to endeavour to make a daily advancement in Masonic knowledge. 
from the very commendable attention you appear to have given to this charge. I am led to hope you will duly appreciate the value of Freemasonry and indelibly imprint on your heart the sacred dictates of truth, of honour and of virtue. So mote it be. Chabolon, you stand before me as a free mason. Free for and in life. For the glory of the Grand Architect of the Universe.